thank, thanks a lot for for joining us. Um, uh, Daniel and I have been doing this podcast, uh, I think, since like 2015, like maybe eight, eight, nine years. Daniel, is that right? About that. Yeah. Yeah. Long, t- a long time. So we've interviewed a bunch of founders, um, you know, a lot of Y Combinator uh, yeah. entrepreneurs, a lot of uh, Stanford yeah. professors. Yeah. Tracy, Tracy, Tracy Young, right? Right, Daniel? Um, yep. So she had a massive exit. Really good, pro- uh, like Stanford professors and whatnot been on but you know i met greg you know he was trying to actually partner up with my previous company and that's how we we kind of like started talking and he was running a podcast and i was like hey that would be great if we like join forces and do a podcast together i guess a little background on vibu and like what he like has done greg so you just have some background but i met him um he was running a company called origami labs (laughs) way back when and this is like really old school y combinator probably like I would say less than 60 companies per batch give or take. Or 63. 63 yeah. okay okay that's close it was just a, it was a different world back then and I, and I feel like uh Vibu has been in like Silicon Valley ever since working with amazing people honestly on all bleeding edge technology I just I followed you for years Vibu like just out of respect I always thought you were like a true like entrepreneur through and through you know I guess we could kind of let you talk about your like story a little bit and like who you are and like how you got to where you're at. Cause like, I would say primarily our our audience is like entrepreneurs and founders. So like you have a lot of experience, years of experience. So maybe we could start from like before origami labs, like, yeah, (laughs) I gotta, (laughs) I gotta find all the memories (laughs) somewhere, somewhere deep inside, but they're all there, you know, all the pain, all the suffering. Yeah. Yeah. Like I'm, you know, on your LinkedIn, I'm actually looking at it right now. Like Roblox, I didn't even know you were there and Roblox is massive. That's like, yeah, I think yeah. probably like a top 10 game for kids. So top three. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's like a complete world in itself, but you were there like early on, you know, that probably like left an impression on you. And then you were at MySpace, like sure. that probably left an impression on you. Like most people like first of all, are not in Silicon Valley. Like, were you here originally or did you move here? I came to the Valley right after I graduated. So um, I'm originally from Philly, but I kind of weird, but I, I knew from really young what I wanted to do exactly in my life. And that was to write code and to build companies, like probably from like age 10 or 11. And so my plan in college pretty much was to move out and do the thing probably like you too like a lot of my inspiration came from uh just jessica livingston's book founders at work and i think i i don't know how i acquired that book but that that was the experience i was chasing and i continued to chase i guess uh to this day interesting so i didn't know it was that book so you read that book like i guess early on you were like looking to be an entrepreneur looking to code but like I guess you were like fumbling through different startup books because back then there weren't there wasn't much content as weird as it sounds like I think today it's so much easier to like yeah. build a startup like back then it was kind of a black box right when I was a kid I would go to my local library to different library public library yeah and I would go to the nonfiction section and I would pick up biographies of Bill Gates uh, the founder of uh, like the guy that created Xbox um, I can't remember his name like Steve Jobs. So I I had like, definitely, uh, I don't know, I'm not exactly sure why, but those that's what I like to read. And that was what I became interested in. There was a documentary film as well called startup.com, which covered a really early Silicon Valley tech startup um, in the kind of like government tech space. And that company ended up not working, but I still like those, that, that like collection of like content was like my anchor. And even in college, I, I used to listen to like, the only thing I would, there's early podcasts back in the day, like this week in startups, no, this yeah. week in tech, um, and a couple other ones like that. So I don't know. It just, um, it was kind of there. That was the rabbit hole of the internet that I found myself in and content and very foundational for me, for sure. What, what was it for you? Did you, did you read those, any of those books I mentioned? For me, it was more situational where 2008 happened and I was left without a job and like the housing crisis was happening. Like they were letting people go. The banking system was like, where we might fail, you know, it was, everything was falling apart. And I just remember thinking like, I need to take control of my own destiny because if the system like can't figure it out, 
it's not going to like protect me. And it was more <laughs> of like an instinctual visceral reaction to like, honestly, the market. And I was like, I need to figure out how to survive in this cold, hard world <laughs> without like, you know, things like bad things happening. I, mean, I think everyone has some kind of survival instinct that leads them on a path, right? Sometimes that's like, uh, you know, a childhood trauma, or sometimes it's like losing a job or some catalyst, you know, for a lot of things like that makes makes a lot of sense. 2008 was hard for a lot of people, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you um, when did you so you graduated around 2008, would you say or? 2000, 2009. Yeah. 2009, so okay. nobody was getting a job in my kind of like class of friends, but I was lucky. I was a pretty gifted programmer and I applied to, I don't know, handful of startups and Roblox was one of them. I had never played the game. I just, uh, <laughs> it was just an application for me. It seemed like an interesting company and uh, yeah, they paid me $85,000 a year and they gave me, I don't know, like 30 or 40,000 shares of which I invested absolutely zero because I didn't even make it a year in <laughs> classic. Damn. But um, yeah, I was employee. Like I, I, I can't remember. I was somewhere between like eight and, and 15, somewhere in that range in Redwood city. Yeah. And even at that point though, it was like a monstrous company that knew, nobody knew about. Like they already had like millions of play, monthly active players. Yeah. The team was just so different from everything else in the Valley. I mean, I, I've no, never seen a company like that even to this day that was like, I don't know, like just like everything they did just worked. Like everything they put out in the world is like they'd have customers for. Uh, it's just such a great market. Like it's like perfect sandbox game for kids where even parents could buy into it, you know, yeah. um, as something that was like healthy and the kids liked it because it was addictive. Yeah, that was a, that was a, that was a cool, cool experience. I mean, you, you started at a rock star company out of the gate, but like being in Philadelphia, getting a job offer out in Silicon Valley, right out of college that's a little scary right like or you were just like bold and you just said i'm just moving nothing to lose i mean the plan for me was to move anyway so okay. i kind of got lucky that getting a job was was pretty easy but i don't know i was different i i've always been a little different i definitely was ready to be on my own and do my you know do my own thing at that time how how did your experiences at, at roblox and ness shape your approach to entrepreneurship I mean, I think those are, to me, those are two very distinct memories. Like for, you know, Nest changed my life because it, the company was acquired when I was there and I had a pretty sizable share allocation. So I got to experience money for the, for the first time. Plus the team at Nest was just like the best hardware team on earth pretty much. So, uh, you know, top down, from, from the top all the way down, like every day I got to work with legends and battery tech and signal processing and all kinds of uh, kind of areas. Uh, Roblox was just um, moved really fast for what they were in the early days of Roblox. And I remember seeing this at What's at WhatsApp too in the early days, which um, if you remember when I was working on Origami, my first company, we were in downtown Mountain View, not too far from uh, where you guys were, like maybe yeah. a mile down the road. I mean, it was like Mountain View was like the epicenter of everything happening in, in that time. But yeah, just uh, we were just off Castro and then the WhatsApp office was right off Castro as well. So we got to know some of those people when they were very, very tiny, but also massive, right? And it was one of the biggest exits of all time in the Valley. Uh, we've kind of forgotten, but but yeah, like the philosophy of Roblox and WhatsApp was like ruthless approach to minimum viable products. Like just doesn't matter how it looks <laughs> at all. If it's ugly, you know, whatever it is, just like ship it, get it out the door, let people um, put their hands on it, make sure it does the one job very well that's hard to unlearn because I, there's this other like feeling that you have to like always want to make everything perfect and and like look nice and all that kind of stuff but roblox i mean you can see it even today like roblox for what they are has one of the worst websites in like you know for their kind of scale they just don't care because they know the heart of their business which is is this like making these awesome games for kids and that's all they really care about you know so and nest is like the exact opposite of that like nothing went out the door that didn't get Tony Fidel's stamp on every single pixel. Um, so I guess both can work, but but yeah, that's something that that I that I noticed early on that that I think is pretty interesting. Did you adopt the uh, move fast and break things mindset more, or, or are you more on the Tony Fidel side of design <laughs> friction? I've gone back and forth. Like I think with time, you you can do a little bit of both. Like you with some experience, you you kind of know the pitfalls before you get out there, but. 
You know, it just depends on the product, honestly, because I do think if you're selling a healthcare product or whatever, right, like you just don't have that option. If you're selling financial infrastructure, uh, a single mistake is big. So I think it's just more about knowing what the consequences are, how important what you're building is. What I do today, very much move fast and break things. We've put out some horrendous looking things um, just to make sure you get it out the door in time. Because what we're doing isn't like, it isn't um, going to cost someone's life if it doesn't work. So, you know, I, I think it just depends. I know um, I really liked Y Combinator's answer. I think it was uh, Michael Seibel, like was talking about how uh, Sam Altman raised, you know, all this money. And Sam Altman was saying, I would have maybe just raised all this money from the get-go of my first company. But he had to go through that journey of going through YC, becoming like a partner at YC, you know, first company, not, you know, you had to sell that. All that journey got him to that point to say that. And I feel like Tony Fidel was in a similar position where he went through a journey. For sure. And he had all these contacts that believed in him. It's hard to just be a, like a new entrepreneur out of the gate and just raise a billion dollars. Just right. It's, it's not practical. I, yeah. I saw that and I thought it was, I understand what he's saying. And like, there's yeah. some, I, I don't know. I, it's just not, it's just not usable advice for 99.999% of the people in the world. But yeah, I don't like whether you move fast or break things has nothing to do with capital raise. Like in fact, I mean, most of the time, the more capital the company raises up front, the hard, the like more unlikely it is that they become successful in some ways. Like at least in the hardware business, which I spent almost a decade in, everything in there got overfunded. Um, everything took way too long to ship. Everything was like needed to be perfect. And, you know, you go, you can go like three, four five years before you get a single customer on your products and you have no idea if they're going to like it by that time. I mean, it's just, uh, I don't know, like that, that's, that obviously is like on one end of the spectrum and is obviously pretty bad. Um, but I do feel like having a lot of capital, um, can like lead you down some paths to that, that aren't so, uh, you know, great if you're, especially if you're inexperienced and you don't know what to do with it. There's yeah. Like when companies have money, they spend it. That's for sure. Especially, uh, new entrepreneurs. Could, could you tell us the story behind the inception of Solana uh, Spaces and its mission to introduce people to the Solana ecosystem? Yeah, sure. Solana Spaces was kind of like last thing I did in retail. And, you know, for many years, I was building a brand called Data, which had these like physical retail stores all over the world. And we went through a very rough time during COVID, as everyone in our space uh, pretty much did. But in that same time period, like during COVID, there was a huge boom in like certain speculative areas, including crypto. And so during COVID, I built a, a little bit of a relationship with folks at Solana Foundation. And initially, there was a conversation about having them show off their like payments products and other things in our, in our beta stores, my, my other company. But uh, that conversation kind of evolved over some time. And um, I got a call from them about two years ago saying that they had this idea to build retail stores. And they wanted to know if I'd be interested in I, you know, creating that and ideating that and bringing it to life. And yeah, beta was kind of like, it was very fortuitous because I was already thinking about what I was going to do, what I was going to do next because uh, beta was at the end of its life. And so, yeah, I had nothing better to do. So I thought, we'll give that a shot. Sounds interesting. Sounds weird. Yeah. For about six months, we designed these like crypto doors <laughs> And yeah, we launched uh, two of them last year and uh, we walked right into like crypto's COVID, which was like this like horrible, horrible uh, year of, of, uh, of trouble for, for the ecosystem. But, but yeah, it was, a, it was a, you know, an interesting time to be in the space as I had just gone through like a two year period of disaster management. And then I, so I already had like the equipment inside to deal with like, a lot of that stuff. But yeah, in February this year, we ended up taking one of the small things that we built there and spinning it out, raising capital and I'm back on the uh, entrepreneurial journey again. Could, could you explain the concept of retail as a service and how, how it's like implemented in your, in your metro? The idea I had in, uh, when I was working at Nest was, let me explain like a little bit about retail industry. There's like two parts of retail. There's online retail, there's physical retail. You know, obviously... Amazon eating everyone's lunch in terms of transactions. But what was interesting was if you looked at and you asked customers the question, 
how did you find out about this product? Like, how did you come to Amazon to buy this, right? It's not like people are, were independently searching Nest thermostat out of nowhere and then buying the thermostat on Amazon. They were being led there by, from somewhere. Um, when we looked at that data set, physical retail was like 35 or 40% of, uh, of the responses. And it was by far the number one source of leads to Amazon.com and to Nest.com. That to me was very interesting because my understanding of the retail model was that you paid the retailer. Sorry, the retailer took a margin when they sold a product. And if you walked out of the store without the product, the retailer didn't get paid. And that is how it works. <laughs> Basically, stores had become a leaky uh, bucket and had become an acquisition channel for, for Amazon. So the thought we had was, but well, what if you could change the business model of retail and make it more of a service model where brands paid the retailer for the attention and for the space and for the resources that the retailer is providing to sell that product. And you walked away as part of that trade. You said, I don't need the sales. You can just pay me for the space and for the service. And I don't care if you want to sell someone on Amazon, you want to sell your product somewhere else. Uh, that's on you to kind of track that and capture that. So we went to market with this. It was really a breakthrough idea for the business. Um, we had a store where every square inch of that store we sold to brands on a monthly basis. And we like, it just led us down this very interesting path because in order to like uh, reconceive of a store as a marketing channel, we had to build all this other software and infrastructure to like instrument the store with analytics and, and other like, you know, tools to let brands kind of get the most out of that. Yeah. I mean, I think, I, I think our thesis was very correct and it continues to be true. Like, of course, like people are every single year, another like two or 3% of transactions moved to the internet. It, that's not going to slow down <laughs> ever. So, so I think the question still is out there for stores. Like, like how do you make money in that, in that universe? And what are you going to do with your leases? I think the solution we had was pretty good. Um, just ran up against like a pretty rough uh, climate there. What do you envision as the future of retail and e-commerce as it evolves? Are there any like inflection points in terms of transformation? I don't know, a AI applied things? Or... I think we know a lot of things about the future. I mean, we know that like people are buying less and less in the stores, although when they do visit stores, they're buying more. Um, so the average basket size continues to increase, but the visitation is down. Traffic, you know, depending on the year, I mean, it's, it's falling, you know, five to 10% every single year. And the customer demographics aren't changing. Young people don't go into stores. You know, you're basically the retail walk-in traffic is just tracking like old people dying. That's basically the like the metric. Um, and like what happens when people like you and me who did go to stores uh, stop going <laughs> and, and we pass away, uh, there's not going to be a lot, a lot there. So to me, like very clearly AI, you know, will improve what, is there from in some in some aspects maybe like search but to me like the storefront has to be focused on entertainment and um, storytelling and experience and and if it can't deliver that kind of thing then people are not going to show up and uh, this was like the big vision I pitched for many years and we because when we were doing this for electronics at the time I, we saw an opportunity in grocery we thought hey maybe grocery stores don't need to be organized by category, but they could be organized by like, you know, recipe or what you're doing. Like there's other ways to kind of conceive of these transactional experiences and turn them into narrative experiences. And I, yeah. I mean, like, I think over like 50 or hundred years, that vision will become true. I think in the short term, it's tough. You have a huge, like, you know, uh, footprint of these locations, transforming them is expensive and retailers don't have the capital to do it. So it's kind of like, better for them just to sit on their innovative dilemma and keep bleeding out dividends until they disappear. Kind of the like sad state of that, that side right now. Blockbuster effect where it takes like a, a new yeah, entrance. For sure. Are you saying retail might go fully online? So you're saying like a hundred years from now, that's a bold statement or would it be a little bit of retail? I think so. I mean, I think it goes mostly online. Like, I mean, this is where like stuff like AI can be very helpful most of the things that people refer to as like, oh, I would never buy that on the internet are like solvable things with computer vision and AI and augmented reality. Like the idea that like, I, I want to make sure something fits is like a totally solvable problem that 
um, that, you know, there are lots of techniques could be, could be figured out. Like you don't have to buy things on the internet that don't fit you. That's just like a data problem. Like what is the size of the shirt and what is the size of your body and all that kind of stuff. Right. So I don't know. It's just like, it's kind of hard to like, to think about okay, what is like the thing that what's the moat that it really has against technology long-term, especially as delivery is becoming instantaneous. I mean, I don't know. I just, it's hard. It's hard for me to see it. I definitely feel like maybe I'm old because I went, I actually went to the mall. I never go to the mall. I went to the mall for the first time and I was like touching and feeling the Nespresso's and I, there was a lucid <laughs> car. It's almost yeah. like you experience like things you would never be around. Like I, it's whatever. It's like coffee. Yeah. But I'm like, oh, these are all varieties yeah. of like new design coffee machines that I haven't really looked at. And I was like, wow, I, I, I could use that. There's yeah. this weird like affinity to like, like it was, sometimes when you're around something, you kind yeah. of understand if it fits in your life or not. And I think that's where it's hard for me to say it's going to go. Oh, out yeah. Totally. Like, well, there's a famous what, thing. Yeah. yeah. You're, exactly. you're describing a really famous effect in retail, which is get the customer's hands to touch the product. Mm. A lot of top brands, they orient their, I mean, Nespresso does an amazing job of this. Like they build their experience for you to put your hands on it. And then you feel very attached to that object. And that's, that is like, a human thing. I'm not saying that they're like, that doesn't work because it obviously does. I'm just wondering what the argument is for you to go in in the first place. Yeah. You know what I mean? And yeah. both Nespresso and Lucid are examples of brands that have a showroom model primarily. And like Nespresso is one of the few like expansive brands in retail because people, they also have a great business model because they have, it's not just selling you one time thing, right? They have, right um replenishment so i'm pretty bearish long term it's hard not to be but there's like little opportunities like nespresso inside of there that can can find some traction i, I guess uh, another question for you so go, like let's backtrack a little bit you know you were working at origami labs you were like a founder at that company in mountain view and then like you get acquired by nest it's like you went from crazy startup to like hardware i remember like that leap happening for you you were very, you know, it was a nimble team. I, I just remember the origami team being very nimble and like trying to make things work. And like, then immediately, like you're in a different environment at Nest. Probably some of the best people in the world, like Tony Fidel is like world renowned as good entrepreneur. I'm like, he seemed very involved with his team. I'm sure it's good For and sure. it's bad all in one, but like the company is successful because of that, like pressure that, you know, but First of all, most companies just die. They don't even get acquired. <laughs> you know, like going through that process, kudos to you, right? Correct, it was, it was acquired. Can I talk about that? Or is that mm -hmm. off the record? Or It was basically an acquire because we weren't doing any kind of hardware thing. But at that time, uh, mobile engineering teams were super highly valued because we were just making this, like everyone was building apps, <laughs> native apps at the time. And we had yeah. one of the best mobile teams in the, in the Valley. Yeah, we had a couple offers actually just like that. Like, how did you, and you were there for a bit of time, you know, like, how did you make that transition? Like, was that a, a hard experience? Like, why would you, when you, you've been an entrepreneur so, so long, like, why do people fail not to get acquired? You did it. You, that was um, a success. And then you were at a rock star company. I don't know. I feel like, I mean, there's so many like conditions inside of there. I mean, we were a team of like, you know, a whole bunch of engineers who are pretty good. And we had a really good introduction in. Um, from from David Lieb on our board, who founded Bump. Um, you, I'm sure you know David. Yeah, yeah. From YC. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. The transition was for my team was very easy. For me, it was a little harder because honestly, we came in and like every single one of our team members had an immediate impact on on this. Like, I mean, we were just kind of like used to working at a much faster speed, even for them, and they were, you know, pretty sizable, pretty pretty like, you know, methodical. I would say the hardest thing was kind of like learning the culture and. Ness was very bureaucratic, I would say, like very structured, like 90% of the team was ex Apple. So like they all picked up that. I don't know if you know, like people work at Apple, I'm sure you do. Like it's definitely like a much more structured company than, <laughs> than yeah. some of the other yeah. tech giants. It was kind of like that. And I was very like much more of a hacker type, like just trying to get stuff done. I didn't really care if I was stepping on someone's toes or area. I would go and jump into someone else's code base and like commit a fix and then come back and not talk to them about it. So I definitely like got pulled into some HR meetings early on, but I know that the founders and 
kind of like leadership appreciated that too. Cause they, you know, sometimes you just need to get something done and get it out there. And um, I think myself and my team kind of had the energy when I was building beta too. Um, we sought out small teams from YC or other places that, um, you know, their company didn't work and we would make them an offer, come on board. And they were always like the go-getters on our team. They helped us kind of break up the, the energy a little bit and like bring something different, bring ideas to the table, all that kind of stuff. It was important for me because I think just seeing, just experiencing the feeling of how that kind of company gets built, the intention. Uh, I wrote about this long ago when, uh, when I left, like never felt like there was any chance the company wasn't going to succeed. Uh, and Tony created that aura around everything. I think it was like, as a younger person, it was easy for me to, to see that as like, oh, he's someone different and he's older and he's got this like skill set that I, I, you know, that was learned under Steve Jobs and, you know, kind of idolized that as I kind of like thought about it more over time and, and looked back on it, like he's just a good entrepreneur and he figured out how to build that aura and he figured out how to um, create that kind of energy around him. And that it's not like something innate it's something anyone can kind of learn how to do. So yeah, it was like, I, I, I was just super inspired by him in general. Uh, and he was difficult, like for a lot of people, he's very difficult, but we have a very good relationship. And I think he, I, I don't know, I really valued working for him and, and, uh, and his team. And then were you there during the transition to Google? Yeah, we I was only there for like four or five months before it was acquired. So it was, wow. yeah, it was like, and then once it was acquired, we continued to remain independent of Google for about a year. So even though we kind of transitioned under Google and we had some Google integration, uh, we were still uh, the Nest team and like the Google Nest team at that time. So that that was like, okay, well, we got like free, we have free breakfast and lunch now, <laughs> which we didn't have free Google um, and all the Google benefits, but we had our own office and their own, you know, kind of equipment and um, and all that kind of, all that kind of jazz. I mean, Google's massive. So it was probably like jaunting to just get acquired and then it's jaunting to like work for Google. It's probably a lot of change happening for the company. It was... Yeah, it really, it really, it was like a huge clash of cultures. Like the Google style and the Apple style are just two different countries, you know. Tony kind of shielded the entity from a lot of that, but like we started to see, like especially the engineering side, engineering managers would parachute in from Google, bringing their, you know, uh, OKR frameworks and all these other things that we were like just totally uh, didn't understand. And like Google has also like really rigorous just like HR infrastructure for tracking performance and doing all these kind of things. And, and honestly, I wanted nothing to do with it, which is why I didn't stay that long. It was like, it was interesting to see. I was like, I just don't, I'm just not, this is not for me. It's all, it's an awesome company. I just, I just can't, I just can't do it. What's so the HR sides from like the Google side and like the OKRs are from the Google side. Like, I guess the Apple culture was structured different, very structured, but like, What's the difference between the yeah. Apple? I mean, I know Google is yeah. kind of like just build fast, but like if it fails, you just cut it. I mean, it's from, from an outsider, like, it's like Google Glass. Like they built this thing, yeah. they launch it, they pour money into it, and then they're like, forget it. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know if Apple works that way. It's like left brain, right brain. You know, I mean, I think like Google is like, you know, incredibly data driven at every level. And like Apple culture is much more about like, breakthrough ideas that come from the top and then everyone kind of hustles together to make that happen. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's very, and it's like led by design and product, like the, the most power and marketing, like the, the nest organizational structure that came from Apple is that the product marketing team is those are the people that control what gets made. And it all starts from, from the message. Like, how are you going to talk about this product? Okay. You understand how you're going to talk about it. Now let's go and figure out what the product is and let's, let's build it. And Google's like exactly the opposite of that. It's like, let's tinker and tinker and tinker. Let's keep looking at it. Let's keep looking at the data, let's pull this stuff. Um, like we just didn't have that kind of discipline um, at Nest. And if you tried to bring that discipline, um, it wasn't like culturally accepted. So right. Um, I don't think that was, yeah. Didn't uh, at the time, it was very public. There was a, a big public spat between Tony and the other like um, Google yeah. execs. And then Tony eventually left like not super long after I did. What's been your most rewarding aspect of your um, startup and entrepreneurship experience so far? Rewarding or like fondest because rewarding is a strong word. 
Hmm. Like maybe the most fun and meaningful, let's say, or fulfilling. Definitely building beta all the way up to COVID. Like we um, we ended up raising a like sixty five million dollar C in two thousand and nineteen summer. Like the life that I had imagined as a kid was was like upon me, and I felt that very strongly. Like we were building something that was working. Um, the team was growing with 250 people. I felt like I had the ability to will things into existence, whatever it was, you know? And I think, uh, I remember, I, I think that, I don't know if it's Paul Graham or someone, maybe it was someone, Sam Altman was talking about like, that like the entrepreneurship gene, gene is like agency. And I think like, I felt like I had gone to that point where I understood what that meant. And I meant like being able to run through walls to get anything that you needed done. And I got really got to express that. Like we were just launching multiple verticals. We acquired Toys R Us out of bankruptcy. We we built JVs in Japan. I was about to sign a deal in India. We did a deal in Dubai. We were in Europe. I was, you know, I was like traveling 150, 200,000 miles a year. Unfortunately, like that's, uh, or not unfortunately. I mean, I'm very fortunate. I got to see what it looked like for a brief moment at that kind of like stage. And yeah, it was just good times. Like, you know, I, uh, there's nothing, there's nothing like that, uh, you know, kind of like product market fit at that level. And I just, uh, I, I need to get back there. That's my, uh, that's my current goal. I mean, I feel like a lot of people burn out and I noticed you didn't like you have a fire in you. Like, Oh, I burned out big time. That's okay. definitely not true. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I mean, you saw my post that I, that I put out there, like COVID was just a shatterer of my ego and everything else like I um I mean we were just so exposed to it like we were growing faster than anyone else in our industry and we had just doubled our we literally a quarter prior we doubled our store count globally we were investing all over the place this like sprint into a, a, a wall where like you wake up and within two weeks I don't have a single customer in my store and every single one of my brands is calling me saying they don't want to pay me anymore even though they love us they can't justify not, you know, like paying for something that they're not getting, which I understood like that, that experience burned me out tremendously. Like I, I, uh, <laughs> it was like the last year of, uh, of company's life. I mean, you know, I mean, I, even when I'm burned out, I, I'm probably executing at like top 1%, but as an entrepreneur, but you know, we tried a lot of things in the last year, but I was really just uh, dragging my, um, my legs with me at that time, uh, to be very honest with you. I think there was a lot of companies, you know, I spoke to one entrepreneur, this is someone from YC, you know, they, they mentioned they had a hundred million dollars of revenue and it went to zero in like, like no time. And they were basically like done. The devastation that happened from COVID, it was like, it was rough on a lot of companies. Like, and that person was burned out. They're like, I don't want to do that again. And this is someone who's a hugely successful entrepreneur. I'm like, man, it's, they're traumatized by like what happened. And they're like, I'll be a VC. I'm surprised. <laughs> yeah. What, what were your strategies to recover from burnout and get back to it? Cause you just started drip, right? Um, I did. Yeah. Like a company right after it was like a different experience. Cause it was, uh, I was backed by a massive crypto foundation. And so there's a little bit less like financial pressure in, in certain places. I don't know. I mean, I, I think, uh, I, I, I think I'm, st- I, st- I think I'm still like, recovering in some ways like i'm still trying to find that same voice and and um my skill set for building companies is very strong you know i remember uh samir calls who's a board member he's a vc at coastal ventures gp there and he, he said something to me very early on building beta. they back beta from like day one i remember bringing some decision to him that was like financial related and he's like he, he was like don't be penny wise pound foolish i never forgot that because the idea that like it's okay to spend money in exchange for growth. That time was like, it's just something I needed to hear. But like the, you kind of like stash these ideas away. And then you, if you go through a period like we did with uh, COVID, you become very conservative, conservative. And so I keep trying to channel that, this, uh, this other side of being an entrepreneur. Cause when something's working, you really do want to lean into it and go with your instincts. You don't want to be held back and be so conservative, right? If there's a big market to kind of chase. Um, so I don't know. I think uh, strategy wise, like it's just been like continuing to build. I've been tweeting a lot. I've been like kind of sharing um, more openly with people, you know, uh, trying to be healthy, lifting, taking care of my kids. I don't know. I 
there's a whole bunch of stuff. I'd probably never like, you know, forget about it, but uh, at least uh, until, until drip is kind of like at the, at the next stage, maybe, maybe uh, things will change for me. We'll see. I guess. Um, I mean, one thing I remember that you did was you, uh, you wrote a really famous, I'm trying to remember the blog post, but it was on a plane. It, it kind of like went viral. Do you remember this? This is probably like seven years ago. And I forget exactly what it was about, but I just remember thinking like you're optimizing every piece of your time and you put, po- you posted this and I was like, Oh man, he's just really he optimized. I, did, I like to write on planes. So that's not surprising to hear, but I, I don't know what you're talking about. I, I, okay. yeah. Writing has been something I've been doing my whole life. So I, yeah, even during origami, I started writing a lot about what I was thinking at the time. When I read that stuff today, I appreciate that version the, the, of the the world that I saw then. You do lose your uh, your innocence a lot, and and that's okay, you know. But I'm kind of like squarely convinced, uh, and you guys won't want to hear this, but that like once you're like once your brain is fully developed, you it's a million times harder to build a big company because you just start over optimizing everything trying to like catch yourself before you, before something doesn't work. And like the biggest companies in the world, they're all started by like 20, like young 20 somethings. Right. Um, Cause I think at that time you just, um, you don't have, you have no inhibitions about you know, what can be built. But I'm sorry, Daniel, like you and me are probably like capped at, you know, <laughs> low tens of billions uh, uh, of value, but that's okay. I just keep going. I mean, honestly, it's more the, the, the game of entrepreneurship. It, it creates like, yeah meaning for me but you know yeah like it's, uh, I, I feel that like it creates culture i don't know I, I like the culture of like building a community of like people working towards a mission and it like creates meaning for my life so when i don't do that i feel like lost a little bit it's kind of crazy oh yeah like, you know what do you do um i guess flipping it just because we only have a few minutes left interlace ventures like you're an investor now and you've been an investor for several years Mm-hmm. What do you look for for investments? Like, what when do you feel confident? And I was talking to an, an entrepreneur yesterday, and he's like, "I have a meeting and no one responds." And I'm like, "There are many many thoughts going through my head. I'm like, why they're not going to invest in the investor? Company. Yeah, the investor is not investing yeah. in an entrepreneur's company. I'm like, what what do you look for? Like, what do you what are you what is your thought process like?" For making investments yeah. and then actually because pulling the trigger is the hardest part and then like finding those entrepreneurs like is it an arduous job is it an easy job like i thought maybe that was a potential path for me post beta and so one of our seed investors uh and asked if i wanted to um come in and you know work, work with them a bit and kind of learn that side of of the world I don't spend a ton of time there, um, like a couple hours a week because I'm focused on building my company, but I, I was getting a ton of deal flow and, um, and he was building, he's like, in, does a lot of retail and tech stuff and kind of my area. I, I think what is like very, what's very hard for founders to see is that what they're building is not necessarily the most important thing to everybody else. And especially when investors, like you have, there might be, you know, 20, 30 other things that they're, that are in their inbox that day. And it's your job as a, as a founder to stand out somehow in that, in that field. And, and the, the truth is like most people don't. And I think there's like the hard part of the job is my observation has been that usually like there are really great companies that are pretty obvious from, from the get go. And those are just competitive to get into. So, you know, like you're trying to figure out how you can add value to them very quickly and express, you know, how, how helpful you can be in different, in different ways. Like pick, picking is not necessarily, I guess, the challenging part. There's just like 99% of the companies are just not ready for venture pretty, pretty clearly. And then, yeah, when you do find one, like you just need to lean in really hard and uh, as an investor and get time with them and just make sure that you have, you know, visibility in their kind of process. I'm very new to that side. It's been a couple of years, but like, I, I wouldn't say I'm a good investor. I, I, it's like, I, I'm more, I'm much more helpful once they're actually, when they have questions about what to do next or looking for intros and stuff like that. That's kind of more my, uh, where I, where I succeed. Got it. So you're built, um, you're more entrepreneur still than, than investor. Do you see yourself going down that path, like long-term or you've been envisioning yourself like being an entrepreneur, like 
Not anymore. I mean, with, with all due respect to my, uh, my partners over there, like, um, I'm just too hands-on and just, like, I, <laughs> it's not what founders need. Most of the time they, uh, when they call for advice, they're not asking you to, to solve their problems or reinvent their business. Um, they're just looking for someone to talk to you. Like, and I'm not good at that. I just, I'm like, Oh, let's, well, have you tried this? Have you tried this? Well, I think this idea is bad. Why don't you do that? Like, that's just not like, that's not the role <laughs> that unless you're on the board, you know, it's just not, not, not your role. So um, I, I, it's too slow for me. I, I'm just, I need to build something. And honestly, I'm just, um, that's my gift to the world. I, I'm not, uh, my gift is not like writing a check to somebody. Looking ahead, what, what new projects or ideas are you most excited to, to explore or develop? I, I know you recently started um, Drip. Maybe, maybe you could talk about that perhaps. Yeah, sure. There are a lot of things to not like about crypto. I always want to give that disclaimer because if you're not from the space, sometimes it's um, it does have like a certain image. The foundational thing about distributed crypto systems is the idea that information is public. And we have this idea called composability, where when you have a piece of data or an image or an asset, that thing is not necessarily in a database. It's exposed to the public and many people can kind of build around that on top of that. Um, and so on. We kind of like, I won't go through the whole stories in all time, but we um, uh, had this thought that, you know, there was something to be built kind of in the creator economy space. And the creator economy has been a huge, massive failure for the most part for actual creators. If you look at the economics of creating YouTube videos, TikTok videos, posting on Instagram, uh, it doesn't exist. I mean, unless you're in the very, 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 very top percentile, that long tail is not being monetized. Um, it's also very hard to grow out of the long tail into, into the short tail these days. And the, the proposed fix from Silicon Valley so far has been like Patreon or like these kind of like ways for creators to take their audience out of a platform somewhere else and then ask them to pay money for that. And that's just a tough value prop because like, I, why would I pay for something that I'm getting for free somewhere else? <laughs> you know, like most people kind of have that opinion, that that like thought and it's very rational. So I think what what we think crypto kind of provides creators here is a way to not ask your fans to buy access from you for for digital goods um but instead to actually buy digital goods um that have retained value uh, instead. And so like what Drip kind of does is we work with independent creators who are artists, um musicians, other people who are normally kind of stuck in the long tail maybe they have a hundred thousand followers on instagram or 300k on tiktok we build them this one place to kind of distribute both their primary content and their exclusive content and it's all on chain and so when creators kind of create with us they're uh, in the process kind of giving back to their audience or giving their fans something that they can keep and they can trade and they can sell even in the future uh and what this does is it galvanizes fan bases very quickly around creators so our Average creator launches on day one with like 10 to 20,000 fans out of the gate. And that's something that like no other platform in the world kind of provides. Uh, we also start paying you right away. We start to make $10, $50, $100 um, just from the get-go. So yeah, basically Drip is Patreon, the creator economy platform, kind of with the reinvented tech stack and, and, a, and a big focus on supporting ind independent creation. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah, I'm actually looking at the web page now. It's kind of cool to see all like the artwork that's on there and the creators doing, you know, the stuff that's being put on there. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being on. I know, uh, Greg, do you have any more questions? Just grateful for you sharing your story with us. And thank you for your time. Yeah, Vibu, this was yeah. awesome just to catch up and just see where you're at. And you're one of the smartest people I know. So I feel like yeah, whatever you work kind. on... Yeah, no, whatever you work on, I feel like there's a high chance of success. So I'm really excited so. like to to see Drip House, like Drip just become successful. It's a really good idea. I'm like, it's it seems really cool, honestly. Just talk you. you talking through it. Are you in Austin now? Texas? I live in Austin now. Yeah, I just moved here a couple months ago. You were, you were right here in Palo Alto. Um what what led you to move? Cost of living. We had our two kids mostly, uh, and wanting a little bit of peace. Um, honestly, moving here has been part of my, uh, like getting some space, having a place I can just walk down the street without any noise. 
uh, has been very, very um, healthy for us and, and our family. It's nice. I, I, like I love Palo Alto, though. I miss it. <laughs> yeah. It's a, so much hustle and bustle here. I feel like it's always on. I mean, that's yes. good in some senses, but also really bad in other senses. Like, it's just, it's not healthy to be working 24 7 and like, um, so sometimes it's just not good, but getting away from that, it's it's healthy to see the other parts of the world. Um, sure. But. Awesome. Cool. Well, thank thank you so much, Vivu. Good luck on your new startup. Thank you again. Very much. Appreciate show. the invite. Yeah, and congratulations to you, Greg. Class of two thousand twenty. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I I just put that up when the pandemic started, and I like it. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Take yeah. care. Awesome. Bye, Bye guys.